Okay, well, first, let me thank Terry, Kim, Pat Johnson. I never even saw a robot or navigation before I came to Cedars almost four years ago. Uh, you know, them and Corey Walker taught me everything I know. And to this day, this week, I was frustrated with a robotic case. And I called up Terry Kim on the way home. And he taught me over the phone how to do it better. So big thank you. Here's the boring disclosures. Here's a real disclosure. Trying to fix a spondylolytic defect in a young athlete with healthy bone is so much harder than a robot-assisted pedicle screw. Uh, I want to thank my MIS fellowship director, Corey Walker, who scrubbed with me probably for the first dozen robot cases to help learn. And I'll say, if you have the opportunity to learn from someone who has been through the brutal uh, learning curve, Learn from them. You don't have to do it all on your own. Okay, so first off, let's talk about who not to fix. If you have no pain with the spondy, there's no problem. Don't fix it. Most people probably don't even know they have a spondy. Most spondies are asymptomatic. When someone bends backwards in this localized pain, they're telling you they have a posterior element fracture, but be careful. It might not be a spondy. It might be a facet fracture, which is kind of like a piece of sand in someone's eye. So before you go into the operating room, I recommend having a CT scan to make sure there's no other problems going on. And if you have a big old gap, you're not going to fix that just with a spotty repair. In a young athlete, you pretty much have to do a front back spine if they're going to return to sports. And beware that sometimes the joint is already destroyed. So just fixing that little broken bone is not going to fix that joint. So look for that, warn the families ahead of time. And of course, if you have a black disc, that could be an independent source of pain. So simply fixing the bone might not take all the pain away. Okay, now let's let, get into the nuts and bolts of how to use a robot to fix a spotty. So by the time young athletes get to me, they've probably had pain for 6, 12, 18 months fail conservative care. A lot of spine surgeons have been trained, don't fix spondies, leave them alone, it'll get better over time, but that just is not the case. And we wanna see is the spondy hot on bone scan or MRI? And for MRI, the sagittal stir sequence. If it looks like it's increased signal there, that's basically pathognomonic for a spondy, you know, it looks like it's in the pedicle, but we know that's what we see for a spondy. And if you see it hot there, that gives you more confidence uh, that the spondy could be causing the pain, but it's not always hot. Sometimes the body has given up on healing and we don't always get a bone scan because that's a lot of radiation. So planning on the robot is essential. And as Terry Kim shared, we now mandate the attendings at least to prove of the planning. I personally try to do them at least a day ahead of time so I could sleep on it. You know, and since we should be having a CT pre-op, it's not that hard to do. And it's very humbling. Look in the upper right corner there. Let's see if I can do a really cool job here. Maybe not. Look how close we are to the joints. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to try one more time to use a pen. Doesn't always work. So look how close we are to the joints here and there. This really is a very, very precise screw. And if you're a millimeter in one direction or the other, you could do a bad job and hurt someone. And if we can, we can look at the skin and perhaps use one incision for both screws, though that's not always possible. Uh, given the choice, I'd rather have both a reference frame on the patient and a surveillance marker so you know if you've hit the reference frame. And the workflow is, this is a typical L5 spondy, use a burr to help prevent skiving, use a drill, guide wire, and then tap across the lytic defect and put the screw across the lytic defect. Now, on the imaging for the robot, it always looks perfect, even if you're in the wrong place. So I believe in a Swiss cheese model of safety. You know, maybe not for every pedicle screw, but yes, for a spondy repair, because again, this is hard bone, very high skive potential, and you have to be exactly in the right place. So I'll bring in a separate fluoro. I'll feel it to make sure you're in the right place and even stimulate the screw. I've had to pull a screw back because it was touching a nerve. 
And here's what it generally looks like. This is my first case. The kid was surfing post-op week two. All of his pain was gone. And, you know, well over a year out, he's lifting back to normal life. So far, I've not had one of these fail. I've not had any screws break. So the first case, we did a CT of five weeks. And look at that haloing around the screw. Whoa, what's going on? Was it infected? Was it loose? I was worried. But it turns out that HA-coded screws look like this at first. They start incorporating three to six weeks. They really get incorporated around 12 weeks. And I don't follow with any more than one CT these days, but for the first case, I kept following to make sure everything was okay. And we could see how with HA-coded screws on both sides of the lysis, it stops motion. And so far, all of these patients have healed. Now there's a lot of pitfalls. These are tough cases. So one pitfall is a super hard bone. If you're half a millimeter off, you're gonna skive. So do your best to try to start on the flattest surface possible, though it's not always possible. And sometimes even if you get the drill in the right place, the screw goes in the wrong place because it's bigger and duller. So why not put in a guide wire? What could go wrong? Well, I'm gonna share a case where I was a bozo. Uh, I violated the typical orthopedic idea that you never put the screw or the tap all the way to the guide wire. Once you get the tap past the lysis, and once you get the screw past the lysis, you can pull out the guide wire. I uh, made the decision to leave this in place. Kid is well over a year out, no symptoms. I think pulling out the broken guide wire would have been worse than leaving it in. Now, if you're doing it at, say, at L3, it's really, really steep. And sometimes, this is a key teaching point, the spinous processes of L4 or S1 or L5 can get in the way. Sometimes you need to cut the spinous process, leave the ligaments attached, just bend it out of the way so you have a clear shot of the screw, put it back in place and it'll heal. And here's a more extreme example of where something upstream got in the way of the robot. And here I was very happy that I tried to feel with a ball tip probe, it didn't feel good. We had the independent uh, C arm, it clearly didn't look good. And the problem here is when we planned it on the robot, the robot didn't see the previous instrumentation, which knocked the, uh, the relatively wide uh, robot arm out of the way. So let's talk about other, another potential problem. If you're dealing with an L5 spondy, which is most common, L5 is locked into the pelvis. It's not gonna move. You know what? L4 moves and L3 moves a lot. So if we have pelvic fixation and we're putting a screw in L5, you know, we could make a one little skin incision, move it to the side, move it to the other side, it should be fine. However, if you have pelvic fixation and you're moving a skin incision in L3, what could happen is you could move the entire spine. And you see on the right, the whole spine was moved to the side but the robot didn't know it. The robot just knew where the pelvis was. So I would say if you're on L3 and probably L4, you should probably put the reference frame on the spinous process of that vertebrae. So if you move it a little bit with retraction, the robot knows where that vertebrae is. So went to bone graft. The number one thing we found out in our series is if it's hot on bone scan or MRI, the body's trying to heal itself, it's more likely to heal. Uh, the two times I've had to go back and bone graft later are cases where the MRI or bone scan wasn't hot. So I'd say in general, any gap more than four millimeters bone graft, if it's not hot, I might even bone graft a two millimeter or three millimeter gap. So here's a kid who had a bigger gap. Um, the surgery, number one, put in the screws. You know, we don't want to move anything around. We want to do minimal dissection, put in the screws. Next, this is kind of cool. You could use the robot to plan a pretend screw to give you the path down to the spondylitic site. So then we could put a guide wire right at the spondylitic site, put down some tubes. If you want to take bone graft through the same incision, and then looking through the microscope in the tube, you could see the threads of the screw crossing the spondylolysis, you know you're in the right site, take out the fibrous tissue, put in the bone graft. And so far, all of these that we've done have healed. You know, I tell patients it's gonna be about three months before you're back to competitive sports. 
Oftentimes it's before that. Um, so here's the patient is now more than two years out, totally returned to all activities, including weightlifting, baseball, and football. Here's a 12-year-old uh, from the East Coast. I ended up using BMP. There was a massive amount of bone graft. I'm not sure we should use BMP all the time. I feel safest with iliac crest and it seems to work, um, but you can get massive amounts of new bone. And this is kind of getting near the end here. Every time I give this talk, someone says, hey, why don't you use a compression screw? Because it does sound appealing. And I bet you the compression screw provides compression at first, but they seem to loosen up later. This is a failure done saying elsewhere. Uh, this surgeon has now changed over to use HA coated screws. My belief without much data is that having an HA coated screw with good fixation on either side of the lytic defect is probably better than trying for the home run of compression, which I think could loosen up over time. And in general, remember the old ways work. If the robot's not working, you could open it up, you could do it with a pedicle screw and a hook. If things aren't working, don't keep proceeding. You could harm someone if you need to open up as a bailout. And the final thought is there's now evidence that when someone has spondylolysis, they are abnormally stressing the disc and causing a black or degenerative disc, which we can't fix. So now that we could fix spondings less invasively, should we perhaps consider doing them sooner before the disc goes bad. So in my opinion, robot-assisted MIS intralaminar screws are difficult. There's lots of challenges, but I really think it's better patient care. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a, a great talk. I, I have one uh, comment that I got from Brandon Carlson in Kansas City, um, and that is uh, when you're doing these uh, bilateral repairs, uh, his protocol, which I've adopted myself and, and found it to be quite good, is to uh, drill, tap, and then go to the other side, drill, tap, screw, and then go back to the first side and place the screw. Because uh, especially if you're starting off on the right side with the clockwise motion of the screw insertion, you can actually twist the vertebra out of plane, and then you'll have a harder time hitting the trajectory that you want on the left side. So uh, uh, just a small point, but it's really kept me out of a lot of trouble. And uh, Dr. Carlson was kind enough to share that with me. Hopefully, you'll find it helpful as well. Yeah, that sounds totally reasonable. Like the idea that we don't want to do anything that moves the spine until we have the correct trajectory drilled. Good suggestion. Kirsten, do you have a question? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Skaggs. Um, so um, I, we did our first one, you know, we emailed you um, a couple weeks ago, and um, we've done one of these so far. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about your patient positioning on the bed, because um, what we thought about beforehand and what was actually really helpful was we put um, the patient on a Wilson frame, um, and that really, really helped with that angle that you were talking about to be able to get um, a little bit better of an angle. So can you talk a little bit about how you position on the bed? Yes. So I did one this week also, and I also used a Wilson frame. Uh, there is some data that using a Wilson frame will open up uh, L5S1 by about five degrees more. So that's a great point, Christian. Thanks for bringing that up. And I want to apologize to everyone in the room that I'm not there. I wish I was there. Seattle Science Foundation is fun, and there's nothing like going out to a faculty dinner with all of you. <laughs> Dave, I'll tell you, um, it's just refreshing to see you go through the process because I saw you starting to use it. I saw your failures and the way you bring it all back home and, and put it so eloquently in a talk, it's great. I mean, because I think for a lot of adopters who like Kirsten and uh, Kirsten and others, like it, it going through each one of those failure cases and being like, okay, I'm going to pull that guide wire out before I put the screw in. I think you've actually saved a lot of uh, failures uh, across uh, whoever's watching. So that's, that's amazing. But um, again, thanks, Dave, for coming in. Um, Martin, are we, uh, are we back on track?